Como es fuerte el sac, eh, no pas. Yo me he una cosa. Se para el cuarto. That's why grandma lived. That's why she had a people. But that's the time nobody hardly take pictures. Nobody know how to take pictures. And she lived right on the radio ground because everything changed now. Everything changed. Change. Ida Nason recalls nearly a century of change among the Plateau Indians in central Washington. Indians have lived along the Columbia River for perhaps 10,000 years. In the 19th century, whites arrived and found the area populated by various bands and tribes. Ida is descended from the Wenatchee and Entiat. Through her first husband, she is tied to the Wanapum and Kittitas. These tribes today we identify as part of the Plateau Indians. Their land was bounded by the Cascade Mountains to the north and west, the Bitterroots to the east, and the high Oregon deserts to the south. At the family cemetery, Ida begins her recollections. This is my stepfather. With her is her youngest son, Alan Aronica, and his family, who live near her on the homestead. Uh, mama, Mama, Dechnap, uh, Mama. A uh, Johnny, a uh, Johnny. Well, this is Mrs. Nation then, white people. The last one, that one, your lady, his name was Humpy. She froze up in the mountain. She couldn't get no fire started. That's what your lady froze. Perhaps the cold winter seemed warmer as the Plateau Indians engaged in their tradition of storytelling. The long evenings were spent at winter villages and Thule mat longhouses as elders entertained with legends and stories of the past. These stories affirmed cultural values and bound family and tribe through a passing on of a shared heritage. Elders such as Ida Nason still provide this role. Oh, wow. That's my sister-in-law. Uh, her name was Lucy. We worked together. Work and play merged. Ida recalls an evening of chopping wood with Lucy. After we get to with the dishes, clean everything around, we get to with the supper. Then she tell me, well, sister-in-law, what you say? We're going to go out. We're going to go out now. What you going to do? One drop. One drop. We're trying to help him, trying to help the man folks. My brother and Johnny, we're trying to help the man folks. All right, with the moonlight. 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 And then, then. Maybe two, maybe three. We spread them tomorrow. We didn't have no oil. We burned wood all of that. Now I got to pay almost $200 for, for to fill my tent. As Ida adapts to change, so did her ancestors. The most overwhelming challenge during recorded history occurred in the 19th century when whites arrived to claim and farm the land. The profound adaptation from the semi-nomadic life to farming was accomplished by Ida's mother's generation. Ida's life, then, is a bridge from the traditional to the modern. Despite her loss of hearing, she talks of the old ways to Alan, his wife Phyllis, and their children Shannon, Sia, and Tony. First work I made. This one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they call it. She speaks of gathering cedar root for making baskets. You pull them. You see that. You get a little, little bit wild. Wild. You put them on the sun. Let them dry. Ah. Not some sheet. A quench. 
one. She teaches ways to preserve and cook food. Man, you have your, your food in that sack separate. Plateau women had to possess enormous knowledge and skill for their people to survive. <laughs> Traditionally, they identified, gathered, and prepared hundreds of edible plants. Mama and Grandma, uh, this is their bread. And um, this... Awful hard to peel. You peel this. And it don't grow around here. It grows in the mountain. As the snow melted, the Indians welcomed spring and the gathering of roots and bulbs. Ida recalled spring in the 1890s as she returns to her birthplace near Kashmir. Everything changed. Everything changed. That's why we used to go up to girls. We dig and we pull sunflowers. We clean it. And that's where, oh, that's where we eat. Poor girls, nothing to eat. Hungry, hungry. <laughs> Still hungry. We sat and watched them from the side hill and watched my oldest brother ride. Brandon. He had quite a few horses. And when it dropped, Mama, she couldn't do nothing. And people start taking the little cayuses. With both her husband and son gone, Ida's mother, Tehanap, moved her family. She eventually remarried and lived on a homestead near the town of Ellensburg. Long way from town. I never thought I was going to see this country in you. While most American Indians were forced onto reservations, both Ida's stepfather and her father-in-law succeeded in obtaining homesteads at the foot of the Wenatchee Mountains. This is where we live. This is where that's his own building. Uh, they got a little lumber, and they built houses. There's nothing here. Nothing. Here, the families applied their traditional habits of industry to their new circumstances. It was nice. Big windows. And Mama sat there, and then she'd need stocking pot. She'd need some sweater, and wool. They used to go around and pick up wool. Moxon. She make moxon. Then she make a rug. Back home. Back home. Back home. She used to sell them. Her grandma did too. They don't stay, Mama and my stepfather, they don't stay all summer. They go down to Dan. Uh, my stepfather fished the salmon. Mama was good, good hand. She tried deer meat. She tried salmon. The season for preserving fish for the winter was also a time to renew bonds of friendship. During late summer, thousands of Native Americans from many tribes came together to counsel, trade, socialize, and race horses. The annual rodeo at Ellensburg keeps alive similar pleasures today. We take our teepee. I used to put it up in the rodeo ground. Great big teepee. Everybody come. It was open. Everybody come from all over. <laughs> and I had another teepee that was my kitchen. <laughs> and the other one, we kept it clean. Rugs, rugs. Then the boss had come round and she was, we hang all the fringe and stuff. We hang uh, in a big teepee. 
and they are at each end. We just pile our dirty dishes. <laughs> Then in the fall, Mama and Grandma, they go up by the east and pick huckleberries. They make a little fire, then they put the huckleberries and dry it and in the sun, then they dry, dry huckleberries. It's what they used to do. Oh, travel all the time. They travel all the time. The human cycle was part of the environmental one. On one huckleberry picking expedition, Ida was expecting one of her seven children. And Johnny then told me, said, you might get sick, you mustn't go too far. If you get sick, you holler for me. You holler. Oh. See, I kept following the very big rock. I got up, oh, very swish, exploded. How much money does I have had a stomach ache? <laughs> and I was just out of it. Oh, I was way, way, way. And she was way in the other in front of a can. That's where she was sick. I keep one, I keep. Oh, berries were just, oh, quite big berries. I said, my look, berries, they have pain. They soon had pain again. She was at the middle of it, but I, I, but I got started and picked my berries. Big basket. But they soon had another pain. She had, before I got down the bottom, she made a leg. I holler, I holler. She heard me. She said she was crippled to her head. I didn't have no clothes, she didn't have nothing. She got that. <laughs> she had a dress. She <laughs> that's, where, that's where my boy William was born. Ida's reminiscences emphasize the unity between people and their environment. This concept is dramatized as Ida passes on to her family the story of how Tehanap, her mother, became a powerful healer. Ah, Mama was a big doctor. Yeah, yeah. It started long on her, yeah. And Mama, she came to be a big woman. She told the Indians, now anybody sick, if they think about me, they come after me. She go, she doctor. But they offered him to pay her. She wouldn't have it. No, she wouldn't have it. She said, I don't want these things. I don't want it. I want the person. Me to see her. She's walk around. She's happy. That's what I like. That's what I love. I just where Mama was. It was pretty good. Mm -mm -mm. But where did her mother get the power to heal? The Plateau Indian peoples sent their children on spirit quests, religious events for boys and girls alike. The elders sent the child to a sacred spot like a mountain or canyon where the child might stay for several days to pray and think. A spirit in the form of an animal, plant, bird, cloud usually appeared and revealed to the child the abilities and for some the power he or she was to possess throughout life. Tehanap, Ida's mother, received the power and Ida tells the story of her spirit quest and how the power was passed from her grandfather to her mother. She was a girl, young girl. Grandma and two sisters and grandpa and mama. I don't know how many they were. And all at once, then they decided they're going to move. I don't know where they were going to move. Horseback. Horseback. 
They got to the campground where they gonna camp. And your man turns around, he tells my mother, Bechnap, you go back again where we camp. Grandpa, that she always had rope made, braided, made out of horse tail. Then he go and he tell Mama, I forgot my rope. You have to go back again, look for my rope. And Mama, she cries, she cries. Da, da. And Grandpa said she was a big doctor. And he told Mama, you go up there, you stay five days. Where we got? I go. Dark, scared, go, scared. And there was that time, lots of animals, lots of things in this country. Although fearful of the dark and the animals, Ida's mother obeys and returns to the mountain to begin her sacred spirit quest, which lasts five nights. This number, five, and the other elements of her vision experience, night, fasting, water, become the vehicles through which Tehanap will transmit her power in her healing ritual. I got up. Sunrise is like that. Sunrise. <laughs> Singing. Pretty thing. He thought about her father. That's right. My father sent me to look for, look for her, look for his rope. So he started to look, look. Just um, just them little things. In that lake, lake, I don't know how big the lake was. He kept looking. They sang, they sang, sang, kept go, go look, let out. Them little bugs, you know, in the lake. I don't know what you call it, this language, but they call it dum dum loya. Dum dum loya. Dum dum loya. And when she used to doctor, Mama doctor always had water in a pan. That's the little lake. That's the little. Five. Everything, five. What she's going to do, five. She's going to doctor. She's going to doctor you, five nights, not in the daytime, a night, five nights. She wouldn't eat. She wouldn't eat. She tells the folks, your folks eat early and get through with everything, and we all get bunched up in one room, and that's why she doctor. And you ought to hear, you ought to hear that she hear that thing. Five nights in the mountain, she come back again, and Mama come home, she lay down, she went to sleep. I don't know how long, then she got sick. She got sick. Get sick. And that was the old man's door. She couldn't walk anymore. She couldn't get up anymore. She couldn't do nothing. She just like, mm, mm. And one day, when the old man straightened it up, and they, had, they put a pole. Of course, it was no floor. It was one of them long people. Five fires. Five fires, fire of the fire, fire, long house. One mama 
ساعتش شکن که رب ده هر وعده هر پر از پول این مل ماما شاید یه هفته پر از پول خواهی کن من داده را پروژ پروژ Ah, the way she hear, the way she hear, they was singing up there. Ah, on the papers. English band, they sing. Five nights, five nights she sing. Then, she, then after that, she'd go and she sing. Sing. The old man straightened it up. Oh, yeah. He gave, he gave his own to a man with the mama. And that's what put her down. And thus did the Tamanwas or power pass to Ida's mother. The power came not from within herself, but from her environment, through the intervention of her elders. For Tehanap, it came from the water, the night, the number five. Through the religious experience of the quest, a young Indian, male or female, learned that a people's spiritual strength flowed from nature, from the land, the elements, the animals, that a human being and the environment were in union. Later that evening, Ida expanded on the ceremony which had culminated her mother's spirit quest. And when Mama, she came to sing, and she told the people what she's going to do. All right. Her hair, she took her hair. She had lots of hair that. Then when she sang, she started out. <laughs> On that fire, to come round. I'll go around five, five, and her hair didn't burn, and the fire burned, and five. I was the start of it. When she started to sing, hanging on a pole, Oh, her feet, her leg got strong. Then she died. People, oh, people. When that people sing her song, they follow her song, and they start singing. I just way Mama did, I guess. I didn't hear what the old folks used to talk about, my aunt. She said she was so strong, she showed on for the good. With this ceremony, Tehanap realized the power. But the old man had begun her training much earlier. The elders saw the differences in character and industry among children and selected those who were to become leaders in their society. Although the training of all children began in infancy, those special ones were expected to be more disciplined and responsible. Tehanap was such a child. Tehanap, you go look for the horses, see if they're together. And that few girls and one boy, no, I, I, oh, I wouldn't see me. And the women folks, sometimes they go and they get mad at the grandpa guys. She said, you keep sending Tehanap why don't you send your boy? Why don't you send the other girls? No, Tehnap's going to do it. Everything Tehnap. You go this. Well, Mama had to go and do this. The other girls, take it easy. <laughs> sleep. One boy, oh, I sleep. Get up and run around. But they cannot do everything. 
on the poor mama, she was so strong on everything. She was so strong, she done everything. <laughs> Clearly, women could become leaders among the Plateau Indians. But as whites moved in and divided the land, Tehanop's generation faced radical change. Tehanop became Julie and used a homestead as her base. But she continued her semi-nomadic seasonal round, which now included wage labor. Da, da, da. We didn't, we didn't get rich either. Everything changed now. It remained for Ida, Tehanop's daughter, to adapt to full-time life on the homestead. We were smoking about 90, 18, 19 cows. Four o'clock in the morning. Four o'clock, we got up. We round up. Ida's life, spanning nearly a century, dramatizes the resourcefulness, the adaptability, the vibrancy of the Plateau Indians. Her stories keep alive for her family the strong values of that culture. Her Indianness is apparent in her respect for the earth, the land, the water, animals. Her belief in the ties of kinship and family. Her respect for elders. And perhaps above all, Ida Nason understands the natural cycle of our world with its seasonal round and the obvious parallels of life following death following life. And I'm getting all up and down. I'm raising cats. <laughs> since I was young, but I'm going to quit now. I'm going to raise no more cats. 